بسم الله اوكي سو so, الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد welcome everybody to the 10 commitments uh inshallah this is going to be a four day program in these blessed days of the hijjah days in which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said no days are more no good deeds are more beloved to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the deeds done in these days and the the Sahaba asked, not even jihad in the path of Allah. And he said, not even jihad in the path of Allah, except for a person who leaves, goes forward with their wealth and with their uh, self, and they don't come back with either of them. Today, we're joined, inshallah ta'ala, by Sister Sara Sultan. And we'll be talking, uh, and myself and Sheikh Suleiman will be here every day, alhamdulillah. And we're, we're very happy to have uh, Sister Sara with us, of course. Sister Sara uh, took the Maghrib world by storm with the course Inside Out and Outside In, alhamdulillah, on Islam and psychology and um, spirituality. And so we're happy to have her back, inshallah, as well as Sheikh Suleiman, of course, the Director of Academic Affairs for Al Maghrib. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Sister Sara. Zakhullah khairan. Very happy to be here, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Welcome, Sheikh Suleiman. Ahlan wa Still hearing to this day from a number of community members the impact that the course had on them inside out. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept outside in and inside out. Alhamdulillah. 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 So the theme for this uh, series, inshallah, over the next couple of days is just um, the 10 commitments. And the idea is Dhul Hijjah is the end of the Islamic calendar. It's the end of the, the end of the year. And so what are 10 commitments that people can hold on to for the next year, inshallah ta'ala, that'll be transformative. That's the idea. And uh, before we begin, I just want to remind everybody, number one, sorry, I want to just thank everybody who's here with us live on Zoom. Um, I see some people, Hafsa from Toronto, I see Mu'mina, I see Naveen. Um, I want y'all to do two things. Number one, tell us what things you want to commit to even beforehand, inshallah, before you hear what our commitments are going to be. Just share what things you want to commit to. If there's one thing that you want to commit to, I see Umar Ibrahim from London and Heavy. Um, and number two, the second thing is, inshallah, share this uh, live right now with, with other people. Send it into your, your WhatsApp groups, your iMessage, all of that. Um, the Hijjah isn't like Ramadan. People kind of, it, it, it's more likely to kind of just um, slip through people's fingertips. People forget about the Hijjah. So just reminding everybody, inshallah, that is a good deed for you as well. Um, so uh, to begin, inshallah, our, our first commitment that we wanted to commit to is, is rahmah, is rahmah, uh, mercy. And uh, Sheikh Suleiman, when this topic of mercy comes up, what does it in inspire in you, this, 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 uh, this attribute? The first thing I actually think about when I hear this is uh, I think about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how much we are in need of it, and connecting our commitment to mercy, to the mercy that we hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, to, to be encompassed with it. And so in a way, I, I would summarize it with think of your relationships uh, with people, with the creation as an extension of your desired relationship with the creator in terms of being merciful, spending on people, concealing the faults of people, alleviating the hardships of people. All of this kind of falls under uh, mercy or pardon and forgive. You're hoping for forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Cutting people off, Allah will cut you off. Thanking the creation is like thanking Allah. So, so many connections between the mercy that we should live with as human beings and commit to as societies, as families, and what we hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. I mean, Sister Sarah, what do you what do you think when when this topic of mercy? Um, and I want to pick your brain on mercy a little bit, but just generally, when you think of the importance of mercy in in as an individual, what does that do for people? You know, I think when I think about mercy, there's like an image that comes into into my mind. So I'm I'm a mom, alhamdulillah. And, you know, one of the, the most beautiful hadiths is the one that describes the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as even greater than the love of a mother to her child, right? And so when I picture mercy, I picture this encompassing, like, um, warmth 
that gives you a feeling of safety, allows you to be vulnerable. And that's what we want with our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to open up to him. It's what we need to make da'a to him. It's what we need to truly grow in our journey toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, you know, mercy a lot, like when we think about the people that we feel closest to, the few people that we feel most open with, the people that we can truly rely on in our lives, those are the people who are most merciful toward us typically, the people who have the most compassion toward us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has so much more. He's beyond the comparison of human beings. So I think about that very often. And then the other, the other thing that comes up when I think about mercy is the concept of um, the giving benefit of the doubt, both toward people and toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those are really very much intertwined. And so that's something I'm hoping we'll have a chance to talk about a little bit today, inshallah. Jamil, you, um, you talked about the mercy of the mother. Now, interestingly enough, this is uh, a spoiler alert. Nobody knows this, I don't think yet. But you actually teach not just Inside Out, but we have an upcoming course with you, uh, The Fiqh of Love with Sheikh Walid Basuni. And this is uh, it's a, it's the topic of marriage, preparing to get married as well as throughout marriage. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the relationship as mawadda and rahma between a husband and wife. Mawadda is love and mercy. So how important is mercy and what does mercy look like when it comes to a, a marital relationship? So, so important. Jazakumullah khair for um, bringing that up. Because, you know, I, I remember taking Fiqh of Love with Sheikh Yasser Rajas actually way back in the day, back in New York. And I remember him talking about this concept of mawadda and rahmah. And one of the things that he said, which I thought was so profound, was the idea that love kind of might get you going right in the relationship it might be a starting point for your marriage or it might develop in your marriage inshallah but mercy is what keeps it flourishing because there are going to be moments where some of that love doesn't feel quite as strong you have you know i view marriage as having seasons right and sometimes you have the springtime of flourishing um of things just growing and feeling like this this love and and, and um, happiness with one another and then sometimes things are hard and that's like the winter of your relationship and mercy in those moments is what keeps it going mercy is what allows you to continue treating your spouse with respect with kindness, with gentleness, even when you might not be feeling that connection quite as strongly. And so mercy is really, really essential in keeping um, a healthy relationship. And that's in marriage and that's in parenting and that's in every, every relationship that we have. So, you know, you said two things that were poetic. You said, uh, number one, mercy, you see warmth, mercy as warmth. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is you said the winter of your relationship. So immediately my mind caught both and I would, I would turn it into saying that mercy is what keeps you warm in the winter. So when your relationship gets cold, that it's that mercy is that blanket, right? It's what keeps you warm. So um, I need finger snaps for that, guys. I need the finger snaps because that was, you know what I mean? Alhamdulillah. Okay, so Jazakumullah khair, guys. Uh, for me, I'll say this about, about mercy. If there's one thing if there's one word to brand Islam with, I believe for me, it would be mercy. Like I ask people all the time and I say, what word do you think of when it comes to Christianity? If there's one word and they'll say love because God is love. And, and that's what Christianity is branded with. You think of Buddhism, you think of peace, you think of, of meditation, you think of these types of concepts. And then when it comes to Islam, you know, everybody's quiet. Nobody wants to answer the question because unfortunately what Islam is branded with is the furthest thing from Islam. But if we had billions of marketing dollars at our disposal, I would say Islam is mercy because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls himself Rahman. It is incredibly powerful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning of 113 chapters of the Quran, it's Bismillah rahman rahim Both attributes denote mercy. Both of them denote mercy. And then in Surah Al-Fatiha, it comes back again. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Ameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. The Prophet وسلم, was restricted to the concept of mercy, his entire messengership. We only sent you as a mercy to the worlds. And so the existence of Islam is only a mercy to the worlds, in, in, uh, which means that the existence of the Muslims should be a mercy 
to the world by extension and every Muslim's presence by following this message should be a mercy to the world. Um, something so beautiful is that we have these running traditions in Islam. Even in the science of hadith, there's a hadith. There are, there are a hadith that are called musalsal. And musalsal means that it has a running tradition. It's just like a quirk within the science of hadith that people do. And so if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi held uh, Mu'adh ibn Jabal and he said to him, I love you. So don't forget to say after every salah, uh, Allahumma inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Right. This, this hadith was paired with an action. It was paired with a declaration of love. And so Mu'adh ibn Jabal, when he narrated it to his students, he also declared love to his student. And then his student declared love to his students. And so it became called Musalsal bin Mahabba. It has the running tradition of the declaration of love. It's just a beautiful tradition within the science of hadith. There's one hadith that's called the Musalsal bin Awaliyah. It was the first thing that was heard from one generation to the next. And so until today, there is a tradition that if you are learning from a sheikh the, for the first time, they begin with this hadith. Because one generation after the other of the Muslims, they all said, it was the first thing that I heard from my sheikh. And it's so beautiful what this hadith is. The Prophet said, in the, it's a hadith that's reported by Tirmidhi and Abu Dawood and others, Ar-Rahman. The merciful will experience mercy from the merciful, from Ar-Rahman. Have mercy on those on earth. The one who is in the heavens will have mercy on you. So one generation of Muslims to the next have been learning this as the first thing that they learn from their teachers, the idea of mercy. Mercy uh, is just so crucial to our, to our faith and it's embedded in, in every aspect in the way that we treat each other, which inshallah ta'ala will lead us to the, the next section inshallah. And that is the, the idea of family. Sheikh Suleiman. Sheikh now, Barak beautiful reflections, Jazakum al and Sister Sada as well. Yeah. I, I want to ask, ask a question that perhaps may be on the minds of those who are uh, here with us, alhamdulillah. We're talking about committing to something for the next, you know, upcoming year and onwards, inshallah, committing for ourselves first and foremost to act upon, and then for, inshallah ta'ala, for the sake of the world around us, uh, that it'll benefit from this commitment. Someone who is struggling to show mercy or to commit to mercy, and they've struggled with it for years, let's say. What's one practical advice we can all perhaps share? Uh, how do we get ourselves to be a little more committed to being merciful in the uh, upcoming year? Is that We can start uh, with Sister Sada, inshallah, and then maybe Sheikh Ammar. I think that's such a wonderful question, mashallah, because the concept of mercy can feel very theoretical. And so the idea of how to enhance that within ourselves, like we know all of the benefits that come from mercy, but how do we enhance our capacity to be merciful, right? And actually, uh, from a psychological perspective, one of the ways that um, research has found that people can start being more merciful toward others is by first being a little bit more merciful to themselves. And so that idea of um, self-compassion is something that's very much emphasized now uh, in the field of psychology for that very reason, because it, it helps you um, mentally, it helps you emotionally, uh, but it also helps you relationally. Because the if you think about the conflicts that you have with people, right? If you, anybody, everybody in the audience, when you're thinking about the most recent difficulty that you had with someone, you said something very pointed, you said something that you regret, how are you feeling about yourself the moment before you did that? And typically what we were feeling in that moment is we were feeling very, very self-critical. When you wake up and you look in the, you know, in the mirror in the morning and you start criticizing your appearance, you start um, belittling yourself for so many different reasons for any mistake that you've made and you emphasize that and you multiply that, how are you going to have any capacity to then be kind to the people around you when you've been so unkind to yourself? So self-compassion is something that is very um is very important in being merciful to others. And it doesn't, and this is why I think a lot of times we as Muslims sometimes struggle with this. We struggle with it because we think it's giving ourselves a free pass. 
We think that if I'm compassionate toward myself, then that means that I'm not holding myself to account. But you can hold yourself to account while still having self-compassion. You can hold yourself to account and, and uh, admit I've made a mistake and repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because self-compassion actually propels you toward Allah, not away from him. And self-criticism oftentimes propels you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the end goal is to get closer to Allah to please him. And so self-compassion can actually help you do that. You know, there's a beautiful hadith where the Rasul when he was um, going around the, the Kaaba, he was praising how amazing the Kaaba is, the sanctity of the Kaaba and all of these things. And then he says that, that the sanctity of the believer is actually even greater than the sanctity of the Kaaba. And one of the, the ways that that manifests is to assume nothing but good of your fellow believer. But then also when you think about the, uh, the, the beauty in this is, are you also assuming good of yourself? Are you also assuming that you have a path back toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you make a mistake? Because when we don't assume that, that ends up preventing us from having mercy uh, toward other people as well. Sheikh Ammar, you're uh, muted. Uh, Sheikh, that was um, very profound and beautiful. And I would say everything that Sasada just mentioned with regards to the yourself, that you just extend that to, to, to others as well. And so when you're looking at someone else, that you remember the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, how he makes mercy conditional. The mercy that you want to experience from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it is conditional on you showing mercy to other people. He says, Man la yurha, la yurha. Whoever does not show mercy will not experience mercy. And this happens in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wal yafu, wal yasfahu, ala Allahu lakum. Do you want to overlook people's faults? Don't you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to overlook your faults and to forgive you? Right? So this uh, this conditionality of treat others the way that you want to be treated, not just want to be treated by people, but the way that you want to be treated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so I think one of the things is to be cognizant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy being extended to people who are merciful. So now it's invested in me as part of my religiosity. It's part of my, my journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I be merciful to people. But how, how do I do that? Well, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa gave the example of proximity. He says, wipe over the head of an orphan. A person complained to him about being very harsh hearted. He said, go and wipe over the, the, the head of the orphan. So the closer you are to people who have problems, the more likely you will be that you will be able to empathize, that you will be able to feel pain, that you will be able to be merciful. And so for us, even placing yourself in that person's shoes, trying to think, um, what would it be like? And what could it be like if I was in that person's circumstance? What would put them in, a, in that position? People aren't evil by nature, or you don't assume the worst of people. So what would make this person be in a situation like that? And the more that you're able to do that, inshallah ta'ala, the more merciful you'll be able to be towards people. I remember with regards to an experience that I had with regards to a brother who did some like crazy things. And I remember I had to call him and his the stuff that he was doing was infuriating this person. And I had the option of calling him and I had the right to call him and scream at him and yell at him and all of that type of stuff. And I had the rapport with him that, that I could have done that. But instead, in that moment, I remember particularly having a conversation with myself about being merciful. And so instead of calling him in rage, which is what he was expecting, I called him and I was asking about him. Like, I asked about him not expecting as if I wasn't expecting this type of behavior for him. And there must have been something that was wrong because there's no way that you could have been doing what I'm hearing that you're doing. And he ended up being so appreciative that I didn't come at him left, but that I came to him as someone who is extending every help. And I came to him in a merciful way. And alhamdulillah, we were able to actually completely rectify his situation because of that approach. And so I'm thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that mercy was able to benefit him. That's a beautiful, Sheikh. Jazakum khairan for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, on, a, on a similar note to what was just stated, uh, I actually once was looking into a number of ahadith in which we are thinking about basically the, the condition that you just mentioned. 
conceal the faults of others or wallahu fi'auni al-abd ma kana abdu fi'auni akhi uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be in your aid so long as you're in the aid of your brother, your sister, pardon and forgive, and there's something interesting about the, the, the point here of thinking about yourself and receiving something from it. You're getting something out of it. In that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows our nature psychologically, that for some people, this will motivate them. For some people who are listening today, this is what will perhaps help you to move forward. Look at all these things uh, that have different elements of mercy within them. And you're hoping for them. You're hoping for forgiveness. You know you're in need of it. So you're giving it to others. But then there's another type, which is maybe you can say more selfless, where you really believe this person deserves to be treated with mercy and you're not getting anything out of it. And the example that I can think of is the Prophet وسلم, with the analogy of uh, people being like moths flying towards a fire. And he's swatting people away from the fire. And the, the moths or the people are insisting on doing what they're doing, insisting on you know, falsehood, ins insisting on sinfulness. The Prophet ﷺ gets nothing out of it, but he's so concerned about the well-being of the ummah, so concerned about your own well-being. And of course, this is the Prophet ﷺ. But one of the, the, the things that we take from this is try to be merciful to others as well and, and think more consciously about what you're saying and what you're doing, even if you're getting nothing out of it. But of course, you may benefit from it in many ways, try to think of it in a, in a selfless way, that this person is uh, deserving of mercy. And the Prophet ﷺ would love for you to do that. So how about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to encompass us with his mercy. That kind of brings us to a practical shift to the second commitment, which we are in need of, and the commitment to family. Uh, there's mercy in it. The commitment to family, uh, first and foremost for all of us here, direct. Uh, family, and then the impact of that on the rest of the world. Uh, we can start maybe by asking uh, Sister Sada, what are some ways, practical ways or motivations uh, for people to emphasize the commitment of family in the uh, coming year? Because we, we see how today in society, as we study in a number of fields, and we see this in sociology, the unit of the family is deteriorating and it's impacting society in so many different ways. And you can speak better to this in terms of the mental health impact, in terms of the moral effect, in terms of other uh, negative effects as well. Uh, why is this something that we should emphasize committing to in the coming year, inshallah ta'ala? Jazakumla khairan for the, the beautiful points that you both mentioned, mashallah, and um, for bringing up the topic of family as well, because you're right that currently there is a move um, that that has allowed people that if if somebody does one thing to you, it's deemed a toxic relationship and you should like this cancel culture mentality of you don't need these people in your life if they're not 100% on board, if they're not 100% supportive, if, you know, there's so many things that are interpreted as toxic that are actually just part and parcel of normal, healthy relationships. Um, and what ends up happening now, and what I'm seeing as uh, kind of the effect of this mentality is that people are very alone and people are very isolated and, and lonely and now not having people around them because they've decided that, my family is just, you know, like, I, I can't deal with this. This is too much, you know? And, and so they end up really alone. And that void is not to be underestimated. There's a reason why Islamically, the family unit is so protected and emphasized. Um, and whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects something, emphasizes something, whenever like the Rasul Sallallahu says that, you know, the best of you is the best to your family and I am the best to my family, there is wisdom in that and there is good in that for us. This is not something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need anything from us. But whatever he, he decrees for us, whatever he commands for us, there is good in it for us. And if we can truly believe that, then it changes the way that we interact uh, with people in our lives. So one of the one of the things, and so from a psychological perspective, this is something that I'm really that I'm really noticing is um, this void that has now been created, and there and and people can't fill it. People can't fill it, and it's very very painful. So I would say, you know, obviously I'm not talking about abusive relationships. I'm talking about you know regular relationships where there's some sort of conflict. Don't give up an entire relationship because of some conflict. Try to work through it because the void that gets left behind when you relinquish that relationship is not something that's easily filled. And so 
one of the practical ways that I think is uh, very important, and it goes beautifully with the with what um, both Sheikh Ammar and Sheikh Sulaiman shared about mercy, is how is to try and um, implement the concept of giving benefit of the doubt to the people in your life, the people that you are closest to, especially. Because a lot of times we give benefit of the doubt, we have this concept of husn al toward people that we're, you know, our friends, you know, and, and things like that, but not toward our family. And giving the benefit of the doubt to the people that we're closest to is so enriching in our lives. I think one of the, the things that has been transformative for me is when I came to the realization, actually, I still remember a particular moment, and it wasn't with family, it was with a complete stranger, that um, when, uh, when I had first gotten married, my husband is from Texas, and we came to Texas for a visit to see my in-laws, and we were in a Walmart parking lot, and we see this guy walking toward us in full cowboy gear full cowboy gear with the hat, the boots, everything. And um, not being from Texas, I had certain misconceptions about Texans uh, and what they would think about seeing a hijabi. And, um, and so as he's walking toward us, I kind of, you know, got a little bit anxious. And in full Texan drawl accent, he just says salam like a full on assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, right? And, and I was so surprised and it caught me, um, it, it caught me in that moment, subhanAllah, because as I'm sure a lot of our sisters here um, who might dress you know, and, and, in, in a way- your with, husband, your husband said that's the imam. <laughs> You know, he didn't, he had no idea that he was going to, he was, he was Muslim either, subhanAllah, but, um, but, and I still haven't witnessed an, a, a real Texan imam in, in, in being here with the boots and all, but, but, um, but subhanAllah, it just, it, that moment really just made me realize that, that, you know, as much as that feeling comes up when you are mischaracterized, right, and people don't see the good in you and actually, you know, um, misinterpret you. Um, that I had done the same to someone. And it was a moment that really, that really um, kind of, that, that kind of stood out to me and was something that I really wanted to make sure that I brought into my personal relationships as well to give people the benefit of the doubt. And so from that moment, it was this idea of people are doing the best that they can. They're not choosing to hurt you purposefully. They're not choosing to not show up. They're, they're not choosing to disempower you or to, um, or to not prioritize the relationship or anything like that. That's not what they're choosing to do. But a lot of times we try to protect ourselves by interpreting people's actions in the worst way possible so that we don't get hurt. But in the end, we are hurting ourselves because we're taking up so much space in our hearts and our minds with all of these grudges and all this negativity. And so really making an effort to train our minds to look for the good, to look for an excuse as to why a person might be, you know, acting this way, like, like Sheikh Ahmad mentioned in the phone call to his friend, look at what happened when he exercised this idea of Hasmid Dhan. It completely opened up his, his friend to, you know, to talk about things in a productive way. And it really solidified their relationship rather than, than tearing it apart. And, um, and one of my favorite ahadith of Rasul is where he talks about how he tells his companion, should I tell you something that's better than extra praying, fasting, and charity? And they said, yes, you know, we would love to, to know that, of course. And he said, it's reconciliation between people, to put things right between people. And Husn al having benefit of the doubt of others, is one of the best ways to put things right between people. So I think that that's a very big factor. If we can implement that in our families, it can really transform our relationships. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. You know, um, you, you mentioned this idea of one uh, negative impression or what have you experienced and get denoted to toxic um, family relationships. They get categorized as toxic and then you are told to, to leave them. And I think that one of the things that magnifies this is social media, especially because everybody just, you will find whatever echo chamber you want online. And I've seen this, I'm sure everybody's seen this where somebody tells a story and it's one-sided on social media. And then they have all of this applause from strangers saying, yes, you don't need them, blah, 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 do you? And so you get 
And I can imagine it's even worse for somebody who's 14 or 15 or 16 or 17. So they don't actually have that experience yet. And they're hearing from all of these people that they should cut this person out of their life, even if it's their mom, even if it's their dad. And so that, that, uh, that online applause from people who aren't really invested in your life is really dangerous. And, and, and I give an easy example of this. The, um, you know, one of my favorite stories is Sheikh Al Albani one time, he was asked by a student, if you love someone for the sake of Allah, should you tell them? And he said, yes, but love for the sake of Allah has a price. And he said, most people aren't willing to pray, 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 not pray, pay the price of love. Most people aren't willing to pay the price of love. He said, do you know what the price is? And everybody's giving different answers. And finally, one person says, uh, the price of love, because people said, you know, like uh, that you love for your brother, what you love for yourself. He's like, no, that's the effect. That's not the price. So what's the price? Someone says, finally, uh, that you enjoin each other in truth and you enjoin each other to patience. And the sheikh said, yes, that is the price of love. Because when you love somebody, you will be more committed to telling them the truth than their own shadow. You will always be telling them the truth because you love them. So if, when your friend comes to you and says that they want a major in a major, that you know is there's zero career opportunity with that major. What do you tell them? <laughs> Mashallah, yeah, you should follow your heart. Yeah, that's a great decision, Mashallah, right? But if your own blood brother or sister came to you and said, I want a major in this major that's gonna have me in debt at a liberal arts school and I'm not gonna be able to make any money out of it, you're gonna tell them over my dead body. There's zero chance that you're gonna major in it. Why? Because I am way more invested in you to let you go down a path like this. And so when I ask people, who are the people who nag you the most? Unanimous consensus, it's your parents. Why are your parents the ones who nag you the most? Because they are the ones who are most willing to pay the price of love. And the price of love is the fact that you're going to be annoyed with them. The price of love is that you are going to be upset that they're not accepting things from you, even though you're being authentically yourself they're not accepting your authentic self and they're telling you, you need to be better and you need to change this behavior because we are all required to grow. And there are things about ourselves that we should work on. And they'll be the ones who insist that you work on these things, even if it's uncomfortable for you. And so they're the ones who are most willing to pay the price of love. The reason is because they're the ones whose love is most sincere. The Arabs, they say, man sadaqak, laysa man sadaqak. They say that your friend, is the one, Sadiq, comes from truthfulness, is the one who is truthful to you, not the one who believes you. I.e., they're not the ones who believe your nonsense. They're not the ones who applaud you when you are, anyway. So the, the price of love. So uh, with regards to commitment to family, I also think it's tied into mercy because family is the one who's deserving of our mercy the most. The people who are, are, are closest to us, like Sir Sadal Sultan mentioned, they're the ones who are, they're the ones who we should be extend that compassion to and that we should appreciate that they're doing their best. Sheikh Suleiman. Beautiful. Jazakumul khairan, Sheikh. And subhanAllah, uh, it is true that uh, friendship does not mean you just encourage whatever it is that the person wants, but rather give them real advice as though you're advising yourself. Uh, I was thinking about how uh, a story that we all know, uh, the incident of the very first revelation, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was very afraid ran back to Khadija radiallahu anha in the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim. And he was afraid and he says, Qad khashitu ala nafsi, I'm worried about myself. In other words, this is a bad thing. I'm, I'm not sure what just happened with Jibreel alayhi salam. And she says, no, there's good news. Kalla abshir. Wallahi ma Allahu abada. She swore by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the creator, that there's no way Allah is going to disgrace you. After living with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa for a long time before he received revelation. She knows him in and out. She really knows his character. Anha. She then describes the, the evidence for why she really believes that the creator is not going to cause you to be ruined, that this is not a bad thing that you just experienced. This is actually a good thing. And she starts with, rahim. she starts with, you're a person who upholds the ties of family. Upholding the ties of family is closer to the fitrah, meaning it's, it's upon the, the natural disposition 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with, that no matter how difficult it gets, you try to keep family together. Of course, we, we have to say this, and we've said this before, we're not talking about exceptional cases. We're not talking about uh, extreme abuse. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the general everyday types of relationships. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Laysa al-mukafi. The one who keeps good relations with family is not the one who is compensating. Just because they're good to me, then I will be good to you. He said, rather the one who keeps good relations with family, walakin al-wasil, the one who really is committed uh, to this, is the one who does so despite being uh, cut off by them. This is why a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu and he said, Ya Rasulullah, and I know a lot of people will relate to this. A lot of people, when we share this hadith, say, I, I have two or three stories just like this. The man said, I have relatives with whom I try to keep a relationship, but they cut me off. I treat them well. You might text on Eid, you might call, you might send them a gift, you might send food. I treat them well, but they treat me badly. I'm forbearing with them, but they're very harsh with me. The Prophet ﷺ said, if it is as you say, if this is a true claim, then it's as if you are the literal translation, as if you're throwing hot ashes at them, meaning they are causing their own consequences and punishment. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be with you as a supporter as long as you remain like this. The, the difficult part of upholding the ties of family in, is when things are not easy. It's not when you're compensating. It's not in the everyday type of scenario. Uh, I was in Edmonton, Canada, and I shared this hadith, and we were talking about family and how important it is. And there was a brother, uh, we stopped for Maghrib prayer, and, and then we continued right after. And there was a brother who came up afterwards. He stayed till Aisha. He said, I came just for salah, and I was going to go back home. He's like, but when I heard that hadith, he said, I started to cry. And this is somebody older, established. He's like, I have my own family now. He said, I cut off my parents more than a decade ago because I didn't like the way that they were talking to me. I said, did they physically abuse you? What happened? He's like, I just didn't like the way they were talking to me. I'm a man. I wanted my own life. He's like, so I ended up cutting them off. And they tried to reach out over the years. And I, I kept closing the doors of communication. So I, I, I didn't realize how serious it was until I heard these stories, these narrations, that I, I actually did something really severe in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by cutting off uh, the, the family ties. Silatul Rahim will be standing, according to one hadith, will be standing next to the Sirat as people cross over the hellfire, praying for the one who used to uphold the ties of family. Imagine crossing over and knowing that, you know what, at least of all things, I held on to the family unit even when things were difficult. Again, yes, there are exceptions, but Silatul Rahim here applies to a lot of the situations in which uh, we experience struggles. So I think one of the practical action items, Imam Al Ghazali, rahimullah, he says, people hold grudges against their family when they wrong them, but when you commit sins, you let your nafs off the hook easily. I'm paraphrasing what he said. So you need to be a little kinder to the people around you and not let yourself off the hook in the sense of being desensitized to the sin, holding yourself to a high standard and holding your family to a different standard as well to be a little more forbearing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring our hearts together. Allahumma ameen. ameen. You know, uh, people, they, they, they respond with, um, you know, people can't, help but feel like but my family is a little bit crazy you know what i mean like my family is a little bit difficult but it's something to be aware of that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who chose your family for you allah is the one who chose your family he's the one who chose for you that uncle he's the one who chose for you those cousins he's the one who chose for you those parents and those siblings and all of that and as he chose all of those people around you that you didn't choose and you didn't have any 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 share in Allah obligated for you to connect the ties of kinship to them. So not just maintenance. We translate Silatul Rahim as maintaining the ties of kinship. But like Shaykh Sulaiman just mentioned, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that it's not reciprocity. It's not that, oh, this person is great with me, so I'm just going to be, that person calls me, so I call them. No, no, he said that connecting the ties of kinship is when you call that person or you connect with the one who's trying to break away from you. And it's tied to mercy in a beautiful way because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, the, the womb in Arabic is ar-Rahim. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I extracted it from my name, ar-Rahman. And so whoever connects, connects it, I connect them. And whoever cuts it, I cut them. And so it is tied to this issue of mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they're the ones who are most deserving of our mercy. And my question for you, Sister Sara, is... What's a, a take home that people can do as far as bettering their family relations with with their with uh, the people who they're obligated to to be good to? So 
in response to that, I want to summarize the points that you both made, because what you were sharing, I think, is an equation for healthy family relationships from both of you, mashallah. The first thing is that intentionality, so everything starts with intentions, right? Our, the Rasul tells us our actions are judged by their intentions. Sheikh Sulaiman mentioned that intention for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not intention for you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It's an intention for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that when I'm working with families, when I'm working with couples, I always mention is do it for the sake of Allah. If you're doing it for your husband, if you're doing it for your parents, the moment they do something that bothers you, you're going to drop it because you're hurt. When you do it for the sake of Allah, then it doesn't always matter what they do. Yes, that hurts. And yes, there's pain. But when you do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that pain gets translated into reward. And so you don't stop doing it because the, the, the reason you're doing it is always there. It's always stable. It's always constant, unlike the people that we would do it for otherwise. So don't do it for people. Do it for Allah and you will have that stability in whatever actions you're choosing and whatever intentions you're choosing. And then the other thing that was um, mentioned that, um, that uh, Sheikh Sulaiman, you mentioned the story of when the Prophet Muhammad came to Khadija anha. And what I was hearing in that story is the perfect way to establish any healthy relationship with anybody, but especially with family, is the validation that she gave him, seeing the good in him and verbalizing that to him. You do that to your children, you do that to your spouse, you do that to your parents, and they shine. And your relationship shines and it grows and the love and mercy between you grows. So that validation is such an important piece, especially before giving feedback, right? Sheikh Ammar, you mentioned that love through action, that true love, the price of it is that even if you're giving this advice to your child and then your child goes to their room and slams the door, you're still going to do it because the reason why you're doing it is not whether your child is happy with you or not, it's because you love them and because you care for them and because you want what's best for them, right? And so that that piece comes into the mix too. Um, and then also that idea of holding yourself to account is when you hold yourself responsible for your role in your family, nothing happens in a vacuum. You know, like they say, when a plant dies, you're not going to blame the plant. You're going to check the soil. You're going to check whether it got enough sunshine, whether it got enough water. So why, when people act out, do we assume this is all about them? Sometimes, yes, you know, people have their own lives and they have their own issues and their own struggles. That A lot of it might be because of them, but hold yourself to account too and think to yourself, how can I change the soil? How can I add more water to this relationship? What nutrients are missing from this relationship that I can embed into it to make a change? Because, you know, it's, it's a very, very important and powerful factor and very empowering for ourselves that on your own, you can even create a positive change in your relationship when you choose. And one of the best ways to do that is to choose to look for what's good and what's working instead of focusing on what's not to, to look, walk into your house today walk into your relation with your the next time you call your parents and try to try to find one thing one thing that's working one thing that's good and emphasize that and it really does create a change mashallah that's a beautiful response subhanallah practical action items for everyone here i'll add just one quick thing that kind of transitions us from this topic of committing to family and the last part in Shalatada of committing to perseverance and uh, endurance, which is remember that one of the uh, subhan, one of the, the mercies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in telling us about the traps of shaitan and the tactics and the objectives is what we hear, uh, whether in the Quran or the authentic reports amongst them in the uh, hadith is that the devil would love and loves for families to be broken apart. Generally speaking, does this mean it's haram to have a family uh, leave or divorce? No, that's not what we're referring to. So let's not talk about exceptions. We're talking here about the case in which uh, an everyday conversation becomes uh, a much bigger problem, a conflict that takes place over many months or many years and ends up causing people to easily uh, cancel out the uh, relationship. Uh, we're talking here about the, the love of the devil to divide and that division between the husband and the wife, between siblings, between parents and their children. Think about it before you respond to a situation. 
that your response can escalate this conflict and today can be ruined because of it, or you can de-escalate with something lighter, you can de-escalate with some mercy, you can de-escalate by not allowing that person's devil, if that person said the wrong thing, not allowing that person's devil to succeed by responding with the same thing of anger, because your standard is not that person's standard at that moment. That family member who said that thing or did that thing or texted that thing, which is not usually recommended when relationships are uh, shaky talk in person, uh, that, that's not your standard. The Prophet is your teacher. Allah subhanahu wa revelation is your guide. But this brings us to the, the final commitment here, which is perseverance. Committing to sabr, which really is not something just for uh, one or two uh, sessions. It's for our, yani every session, every lecture, every program, every day of our lives that we have to keep rededicating ourselves to it. What do you do when you feel like you don't have endurance, when you don't have perseverance, the habits in your everyday life, not just now in the hijjah not just in Ramadan next year, but throughout your life, what do you do when you feel like you uh, need to be a person of uh, sabr? Sheikh Ammar, if you want to start us off with that one. This word sabr is everything. It's everything. It's translated as patience. It's way too big of a word for just patience. Sabr is perseverance. Sabr is determination. Sabr is grit. Sabr is um, perseverance. Sabr is persistence. Sabr is all of these things. And, and it's active. It's not just, you know, when we think of patience, we think of something that's passive. Something's happening to you and you're just kind of being patient. But you actually have to have sabr through things. You persevere through things. And there's nothing more valuable. The Prophet ﷺ said a person was not given anything that's more comprehensive than sabr. There's nothing that's more comprehensive than sabr. It is the greatest tool for success after the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards any goal. You take, you take anybody who's successful in anything and they might not have intelligence. That might not be a shared characteristic. They might not have you know, physical talents. That might not be a shared characteristic. But what they must have had to get to anything worth getting to is perseverance that they showed up and showed up and showed up and tried and tried and tried and tried again until they were able to reach that success until they're able to accomplish that goal and that's why Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah he says that no prophet or anyone less than them acquired anything except through patience except through sabr not patience but sabr okay this this it's cumulative word and so I actually think that this um is something incredible to commit to that a person uh you know there's actually a, a poster that i used to have hanging in my wall before i um it was knocked down by the end someone had i posted it on instagram and then all of it, it fell off of my wall one year i mean that was just it was unbelievable how it happened it was just hanging on my wall there was a poster that i wanted to hang for so long but it's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and it's just a beautiful hadith. And I would tell anybody, you want to copy this hadith, you want to put it on your wall, don't post it on Instagram because some people hit with two eyes and it'll it'll jump off of your wall. But this hadith is really like the keys to success. And the Prophet ﷺ says in the hadith reported by Muslim, the hadith of Abu Huraira, Rasulullah ﷺ, he says, focus on what benefits you. And that's the first step. So if you're talking about the Hijjah next year, you got to figure out what your goals are. That's the first step. You figure out what your goals are. What do you want? What do you, is it your family that you want to work on? Is it your spirituality that you want to work on? Is it your business that you want to work on? Is it your school that you want to work on? What is it that you want? Focus on what benefits you. And that's something beautiful too, that if you're able to be passionate about things that benefit you, because a lot of us are really, really passionate about things that don't benefit us, sports and all sorts of things, you know? So then he says, Number two, wasta'in billah, seek the help of Allah. And that's what no self-help book will teach you. They'll teach you about goal setting and they'll teach you about the third step. But that second step where you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're going to have a session about dua inshallah in the next couple of days as well. But asking Allah is incredibly important. And then number three, he says, wala ta'jiz. He says, and then don't give up. Once you figure it out what it is that you want, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. And number three, don't give up, i.e. be persistent, continue, try, come again, start again, continue until inshallah ta'ala you get to your goal. If you do these three things, inshallah, no matter what your goal is, inshallah, you'll eventually get there. Sheikh Ammar, the, the, uh, is that going to cost us all $1,000?
you just gave us like all self-development in, in one hadith. Bro, I and mean, this hadith is amazing. This hadith is incredible. That's why I told you I had it hanging on my wall because if there's one thing that I wanted, it's, it was this hadith. Sheikh, la ta'ajaz, put it back up, inshallah ta'ala. We, uh, we have this hadith covered in the Sahih Muslim class and it was one of the uh, most like beloved hadith to the students. If you look at this narration and others and all the ayat of the Quran about sabr, it's linked to success all the time, always. You cannot be a winner. So sabr really is a, an extensive, powerful trait. It's a lifestyle of winners, the people of success. It's a vision that you have for the future. It's your trust in Allah. It's not giving up uh, when things get difficult. It's standing up every time you fall down. It's just we can talk about sabr for, for a long time and enjoy it. At the end of the day, we need to also not just look at the, the uh, final destination that we're seeking. We need something very, very practical. So you need to know what, you, what it is that you want. You need to know the tools that will help you along the way. So trust in Allah is one of them. Uh, the methods, the techniques that you have to be uh, enduring, for example, with getting up and praying on time with uh, your family and restraining from saying the wrong thing. That requires a lot of sabr. Being merciful to other people in, in this day and age in which there's a lot of hatred and division in society, it requires uh, sabr as well. So there's a, a lot of different angles to this. Uh, Sister Sara, if you can give us uh, maybe one of your favorite or top advices for people to hold on and commit to perseverance in the coming year, inshallah. Absolutely. I think that, you know, sabr, like you're all saying, you know, both of you are saying, is essential for any any type of growth um in order to it's in in the psychological world right it might be termed as like resilience it might be termed as distress tolerance these are all things that you need in order to succeed in any way which is the ability to be uncomfortable and be okay with being uncomfortable because that's what patience is is that to get up for fed you need to be able to be uncomfortable and choose that discomfort in order to gain the comfort that actually matters in the hereafter, right? And so I think that one of the things that really, uh, from a practical perspective, that really helps us to enhance our level of, of sub or whatever uh, translation you want to use for it, is to shift our mindset. I think our mentality about the things that we are faced with is what really stops us from being able to face them in the best of ways. Whether it's conflict with family, whether it's um, getting up for veg, or whether it's doing anything that, that requires patience. A lot of times we, we view it from a negative perspective of like, I have to, I have to do this. I'm so, you know, I'm tired of, you know, like I'm tired, but I have to do this, so I'm gonna do it. When you switch that to I get to, I get to do this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided me to Islam and I have the opportunity to get up and pray to him and worship him. I have the opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me these two legs. I have, I get to get up for fetch. I get to go out and exercise. I get to how many families have wished that they could have a child and they don't have a child. I get to take care of my child and give them a meal or whatever it is that's difficult. Shifting a mentality, shifting your mentality, thinking about the hadith of Rasulullah of the reward for any type of disease, sorrow, sadness, any distress that befalls a Muslim, even the prick of a thorn, it's an expiation of sins, right? Which allows us to increase in our sub. Uh, thinking about if this situation hadn't happened, what pieces of me would be missing? What quality have I gained through dealing with this difficult scenario, whether it's a conflict with family, you never would have, you will never ever learn conflict management skills from a book. It will only be through human interaction. What, what skills have I gained through this conflict? What strengths have I gained because I went through this hardship? What would I be missing if I had not had the opportunity to deal with that? And when we shift our mindset, that allows us to be patient, that allows us to have that perseverance or that resilience through whatever we're going through. That's a paradigm shift, subhanAllah. The people of Jannah will look back and say, I wish I could go back and do this again. Ya Allah, I wish I could do more. The, the shuhada, the martyrs, that's all they, they're asking for. If only we could come back and do this again for your sake, Ya Allah. Embracing, subhanAllah is going to say the same thing, embracing discomfort and realizing, in fact, there's good uh, in it there's uh, growth in it there's purification in it uh, in this upcoming year we can all turn to the the reminders that people need on a daily basis through the quran and through salah as well um, and then the the shift in perspective sheikh amar if you want to give us an advice and uh, i guess close us off inshallah ta'ala 
I mean, there's so much more that could be said about sabr. I think it's beautiful. You had mentioned about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, mentions them entering paradise because of their patience, because of their endurance, because of their resilience, their perseverance. It's just, to me, it's beautiful how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pairs it with turning to him always. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is your source of endurance. You get uh, patience from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people of uh, the Sahara of Fir'aun, they said, Afrigh alayna sabra. They said to Allah, cascade upon us patience when you're going through difficulty that you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That paradigm shift always is what helps you go through patience, that what helps you go through difficulty when you expect goodness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why you're taught to say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, when you go through a challenge, that you say, Allahumma ajirni fi musibati wa khilfni khayra minha. You say, oh Allah, reward me in my calamity. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu famously said that I never afflicted with a calamity except that I realized that there are a number of blessings included in it. And one of the blessings that he mentioned is that I hope to be rewarded for it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pairs patience with turning to him as a means of success. And so Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah twice, Ista'inu bis sabri wa salah. Allah says, seek help in two things. Internally, your own endurance, your own resilience, but also externally in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in salah, that you're connecting with Allah. Allah says at the end of Surah Al-Imran, Ya wasbiru wa sabiru wa rabitu wa taqullah la'allakum tuflihun. Allah says, isbiru, have patience, wa sabiru, and compete with each other in patience, outlast one another, and Rabitu, hold fast, with taqullah, and have taqwa of Allah. Taqwa of Allah is turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you do that, you have you hold the fort down with regards to your patience, you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you will be successful in whatever endeavor you uh, undertake, inshallah ta'ala. It's, it's very, very beautiful. Sister Sarra, I want to thank you for, you know, we had to start off big, so we had to start off with you. So Jazakallah khair for joining us. And, and if you could let us know what your projects are, what, what's going on in your world these days. Jazakallah khairan for, for having me. It was, um, it was a privilege to, to be here and to be able to um, speak with you and to, to this wonderful audience on these blessed days of Dhul Hijjah, alhamdulillah. Um, as far on my end, um, so alhamdulillah, we did the, I, I did, our partial recording of um, Fiqh of Love with Sheikh Walid, really enjoyed that, um, alhamdulillah. Um, there's another course that's coming up that's marriage related. I don't know if, if I can share, I don't, I don't know the restrictions on what I can share about it, but that's another one that's gonna be recorded very soon. So that'll be um, released, uh, uh, you know, uh, sometime, sometime in the coming months, inshallah. Um, and so that's been, uh, that's what I'm prepping for right now. I'll be recording that next week, inshallah. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. And um, for everybody else, Sheikh Suleiman and I will be hosting, inshallah ta'ala, this uh, series over the next couple of days, inshallah. And uh, in the days of the Hijjah, of course, if you want to support Al Maghrib, um, we have a link for you, inshallah, in the chat. It's almaghrib.org forward slash donate. Uh, Sheikh Ibn Uthameen says something really beautiful. He says that a dollar that's donated in the Hijjah versus a dollar that's donated in Ramadan, which one is more beloved to Allah? Hold on a second. It's Ramadan, right? Ramadan is when everybody donates everything they've got. He says, between me and you is the book of Allah. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, there are no days in which, meaning the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there are no days in which good deeds are more beloved to Allah than in these days. And so in these days, all good actions are more beloved to Allah, including Sadaqah. And so it's just a reminder. Rahimahullah, he said, it's incumbent upon people to continue to teach the masses these concepts because people just absorbed that Ramadan is the best time to do anything. But in reality, these 10 days are very, very special indeed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We'll see everybody tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala. Tomorrow we're joined by Shaykh Umar Suleyman and Shaykh Suleyman, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khair, and we'll see everybody very soon. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum.